First one, let me read to you. This is from Mark 9. Um, Then we'll pray and we'll see what God would have for us today. When they came to the disciples, this is Jesus and three of his disciples, come and meet the other disciples. They saw a a large crowd around them and scribes disputing with them. When the whole crowd saw them, saw him, they were amazed and ran to greet him. He asked them, what are you arguing with them about? Someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive him out, but they couldn't. He replied to them, you unbelieving generation, how long will I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring him to me. You can hear Jesus' frustration in the passage. So they brought the boy to him. When the spirit saw him, it immediately threw the boy into convulsions. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening to him? Jesus asked the father. From childhood, he said, and many times it has thrown him into fire or water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help him. Jesus said to him, if you can, everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately, the father of the boy boy cried out, I do believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the crowd was quickly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to him, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. Then it came out, shrieking and throwing him into terrible convulsions. The boy became like a corpse, so that many said he's dead. But Jesus, taking him by the hand, raised him up, and he stood up. After he had gone into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive him out? And he told them, this kind can only come out by nothing but prayer. Let's pray, see what what God would have for us today. And so, Father, we need your help as always as we come to your scriptures. We need your help. We don't want to just apply our own understanding or bring our own thinking to the text and read into the text. But Father, we want to gain the mind of Christ. So help us have open hearts and minds, a soft spirit to your Holy Spirit. Help us to think more like Jesus in our reading and in our understanding. Help us to uh, relate to you more like your Son. And Father, in every way, help us to bring you glory with our lives in the light of what we learned today. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so setting the, setting the scene, Peter, James, and John had just been invited by Jesus to go up a really big mountain. And on this mountain is this very famous happening, which uh, we know is the Transfiguration, where Jesus, uh, he's revealed in his glory. And uh, some like Old Testament witnesses, very well-known people, Moses, Moses and Elijah, uh, appear next to him. And Peter's like, wow, this is phenomenal. I can't believe we're alive to see what we're seeing right now. So let's, can I build you some houses? Can we like dwell together? This is momentous. Let's, let's extend this as long as we possibly can. Uh, and Jesus says, that's not what's going on here. Glorified. Uh, not, not post-resurrection glorif- glorification, but glorified as in identified as the Christ in a supernatural kind of way by the Father. And they're coming down from this phenomenal experience and they see a crowd and the other disciples arguing with some of the scribes who were some of the religious leaders. And that's basically, that's basically uh, what, what we're you know, how we come to the scene today. And we come down in verse 16, Jesus asks, what are you arguing about to his disciples? And so from the beginning, he just had this, I mean, phenomenal experience. Uh, The other disciples, absolutely in awe of what they saw. They come down and immediately, Jesus is frustrated. And I'm wondering if you, like me, find it just a tiny little bit encouraging that the disciples who've been walking with Jesus for years at this point, still are like idiots sometimes, still grumble, still argue, still fail pretty regularly. The, the very next story in Mark, if you keep reading after this, uh, the, after the story with the unclean spirit and the father and the son, 
is the disciples arguing about who's the greatest. And Jesus, you hear his frustration here. <laughs> the next story, as they keep going on, they're arguing about who's the greatest. And Jesus is just like, what is going on? I mean, he knew what was going on. But man, these, these disciples, they're not intellectual giants. Right? They're not captains of industry. They're not uh, like particularly gifted artists or they have no like sporting achievements. They're not governing officials or influencers or anything like that. They're not even very good fishermen. If you read some of their stories of when they go fishing, they're not even necessarily particularly skilled fishermen. Um, and yet, these very, very ordinary people, they're the ones that God uses in such wonderful and extraordinary ways, in particular once empowered by the Holy Spirit. So you see them kind of in the natural. And even, even they have done some really amazing things already. We'll look at that in a minute. Uh, Jesus has, they've certainly seen Jesus do some amazing things. They've been able to speak some things that have only been given to them by God. And so they've been able to participate in Jesus' work already, you know, before, I mean, really, truly receiving the Holy Spirit. And yet, man, if you, if you get frustrated with the, man, how come I keep doing foolish things or idiotic things or how is it that uh, it seems that like I'm so slow to learn? Uh, please be encouraged by the story of the disciples who almost now three years into walking with Jesus, still arguing, still grumbling. And so Jesus asks, what are you arguing about? And a dad calls out from the crowd, verse 17, Teacher, <clears throat> I brought my son to you. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth, becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive him out, or drive it out, but they couldn't. And so what kind of being is this? <clears throat> what? So the, the father has a son who is being uh, demonized. The son is being, uh, he has a spirit, the father says, that makes him unable to speak, and is treating him horrifically. He calls it an, an unclean spirit. Uh, Matthew, this, the Gospel of Matthew, uh, calls it a demon. In Luke, Luke calls it a spirit, and then another time calls it a demon, and then, then another time calls it an unclean spirit, um, saying that it's you know it's one of or can you know the thing that it is could be called any of these kinds of things. So what is an unclean spirit? What is a demon? Uh, what is a spirit in this sense? Is it a fallen angel? Is it a wandering spirit? Is it uh, mere sickness to people who just don't have the like, technological understanding, like medicinal understanding that we have today? What are we looking at here? I find it very interesting. Uh, Jesus has just, camp, just come down from uh, traditionally this mountain, uh, where the transfiguration happened, was considered to be Mount Tabor. Uh, but increasingly, people are thinking that it's Mount Hermon, which is the tallest mountain in the region. And, uh, you know, increasingly, scholars pointing to Mount Hermon. And in, in the Jewish mind, Mount Hermon had a place of uh, particular significance. It was a place that some considered to be ground zero of the rebellion against Yahweh of some of the heavenly hosts, like those, some of those spiritual beings who didn't stay in their God-given places of authority but rather rebelled against God. Uh, it's not one of the books of the Bible, but it is a book that the Jewish people had in the time of Jesus that is actually quoted by uh, some of the other authors of Scripture. So it was a book that, you know, we don't necessarily view as Scripture, or we don't view as Scripture, but that the Scripture writers and the people in the day of Jesus certainly would have been aware of. It would have kind of loomed large in their thinking as a Jewish people. That Jesus had just gone onto this mountain, the scene of, in their minds at least, uh, great spiritual rebellion, and he comes down. For, and on that mountain, Jesus has this uh, moment of... Uh, being, being revealed, at least, in his glory. 
like stamping his authority in the very place in the minds of the Jewish people of spiritual rebellion, Jesus stamps his spiritual authority. And then as he comes down, he has this encounter with a rebel spirit. So whatever you, your view is of demons, <clears throat> my hope is when you think about demons, you don't think about uh, like pitchforks and pointy horns and you know, fiery red capes. And um, like I used to play this video game growing up called Diablo uh, where it was kind of like all, all of the medieval um, you know, gargoyles and paintings of you know, Dante Inferno styled and uh, informed pictures of hell and demons. We looked at this last week where there is a, there is very ordinary demonic, which is just participating in the works of the rebellious spirits. And there is the more extraordinary demonic, which is the kind of stuff that we're looking at today. And what we, what we do know is that this is absolutely a spiritual being uh, whatever the nature of that spiritual being is, but it's one in defiance to, in rebellion of, the authority of God. And it's specifically trying to stamp its authority among the people of God. Look at this again last week. The, the natural demonic is participating in, in the work of Satan, the deceiver, the destroyer. And that's what we see happening here in a very tangible, material sense where the sun is disordered because of the demonic influence and the family is disordered because of the demonic influence and likely the community is disordered. And not just disordered, but, but grieved, harmed, hurt, suffering. And he's obviously heard about, this dad has heard about Jesus and heard about the disciples. And heard about the disciples that got sent out by Jesus who went around healing people and casting out unclean spirits and demons. It says dad's heard about these disciples who can deliver people from the exact problem that his son has. And so he comes searching for them and he finds them. He's like, I found you, you guys, who, if you read a little bit earlier in Mark, were sent out by Jesus, were given authority and go out and do these kinds of things. And they can't do it. So Jesus comes down, after stepping his authority comes down, disciples are there, they couldn't do it, and the dad yells out, they couldn't do it. And Jesus is frustrated again. Verse 19, he replied to them, you unbelieving generation, I don't think he's directing this at the dad, because <clears throat> the dad has come to him. The dad's asked him for help. He's coming to the, to the right place, to the disciples who should have been able to help him and had previously helped other people. I think he's frustrated with the disciples. How long will I be with you? He knows his time is short. He won't be there for much longer. And I still haven't got it. How long must I put up with you, he says. Bring them to me. He's like, man, you've, you've been with me for three years. How long is it going to take? You've seen me work. You've done, you've participated in the works. Come on. As soon as the unclean spirit sees Jesus, it recognises him, starts to put on a show, starts to you know, flail this poor kid about. The dad tells Jesus it's been happening since he was a boy, throwing him into the water, trying to kill him, throwing him into fire, trying to kill him, preventing him from speaking. So the, the, this poor kid, man, couldn't participate in community with others. We tend to, we don't tend to see this kind of the extraordinary demonic work in Australia at least uh, these days, although it absolutely does happen. Uh, we are very accustomed to seeing the ordinary work of the demonic, of the demonic, demonic in, our, in Australia today. The dad's desperate loves this kid, cares for his, for his son, but totally unable to do anything to help him. Thought he'd finally found the solution, these disciples who he'd heard about, and they couldn't help him either. He has no tools, no power, no authority, totally helpless in the face of a powerful enemy. 
this dad. And so he comes to Jesus and he says, if you can, help us. If you can. Now, I wonder, how, like, where's the emphasis in this sentence? Is he saying, if you can, help? Or is he saying, like, if you can, help? Uh, or if you can, like, questioning if you can actually do it. So, you know, if you can, are you capable? Um, if you can, are you the one who can help me? But either way, Jesus says, if I can. If I can. He's frustrated again. If you can. This is a very different interaction than the one that happened uh, back in chapter 1, where the leper who comes to him and says, if you desire, you can make me whole. Which is very different to if you are able, you can make me whole. The leper sees in Jesus the authority and says, I know you can do it. If you desire to do it, you can help me. Whereas the dad frustrates Jesus because he says, if, you can, if you're able to do it, would you please do it? And here's the key. Jesus replies, everything is possible for the one who believes. Everything. And what does he mean when he says everything? I mean, he means everything. Even this problem that the dad is totally unable in his own strength, in his own power, in his own authority, uh, and, and in every sense in the natural, totally unable to overcome or help himself. And Jesus says, everything is possible for the one who believes. And so the dad replies, I do believe. I do believe. I actually think this is one of the most powerful statements in the history of the world that this dad makes. He says, I do believe, help my unbelief. He says, yes, I believe. And I need your help to believe. What's he saying? So belief informs your actions. What you believe informs your activity. We actually talk about this quite often at Cedar Light. So again, you're sitting in these, in these seats because you believe you trust that those seats will hold your weight, that they, that they will provide you know, the relief from standing. Uh, you, you believe it and therefore you put into action, you activate those beliefs by doing that thing. And so because uh, belief informs action, what you believe is incredibly powerful and important. Emotions, the dad's emotions here, he's full of fear and also full of hope. He wouldn't have brought, like his, again, you follow his activity. His activity is he's brought his son to Jesus. And so he has some belief, but he also has some fear. And emotions, they are good and they're necessary at helping us to express and live our humanity. Emotions are, we need, we need our emotions. Emotions are awesome. They're helpful to, uh, you know, they contribute to, right decision making. So if, you know, I, if I fit, rightly fear something, it will help me to rationally engage with that thing with my activity. So emotions are really helpful, but they're terrible leaders. So when we follow our emotions, that's where we get off track. And what the dad here says is, despite my feeling telling me that I should act out of fear, I am willfully acting out of hope. So he's saying, uh, uh, don't, this old line that I love, uh, don't ask me how, don't just ask me how I feel, also ask me what I know. So again, I'm not trying to discount emotions. Emotions are incredibly important. When it comes to belief, we also need to know what it is that we know. And so he's saying, what I know is you have the authority. That's what I know. Even though I don't feel it necessarily, or even though I'm too afraid to hope for it, I know it. And so he says, so help. I believe, help my unbelief. So powerful. Because all of us feel this way from time to time when it comes to uh, our relationship with God. <clears throat> Either when the, the problem, whether it be a spiritual problem, whether it be a physical problem, whether it be a mental problem, whether it be a relational problem, whether it be a material problem, when those things loom so large or when they're so immediate or when we feel buried underneath it, it's harder in those times to rightly perceive the authority of Jesus over all of our problems, that everything is possible to him who believes. 
So it's at those times we need to operate not out of our feelings, but out of what we know to be true and activate our belief. Like put it into action. And this is what the dad does here. I believe, help my unbelief, is not a contradictory statement. It's an acknowledgement of who Jesus is and a request to help live in it from the one who can actually do anything. Even though he trusts in Jesus, he needs help to put that trust into action. It's like saying, I I do trust that you will do what you say, that you can do it. I trust you. I believe in you. I'm aligning with you. I put my allegiance to you. Even though I don't feel it, I'm going to put it into action because I know it to be true. That's what he's saying. And Jesus responds to this trust, responds to this faith, and he does it. He rebukes the unclean spirit, commands it to go. And the spirit for whom he was an, he was a, an unconquerable enemy to all the disciples, certainly to the dad, he had no power or, or authority over him, totally inept, totally unable to do anything to challenge or change that context, the situation. And Jesus just with a word, just exercising his own internal authority. This this unclean spirit has no option but to obey and does. The boy looks lifeless. Jesus picks him up full of life. The dad who probably started the day full of hope and probably fear, wondering, will I be able to get to Jesus? I've heard the stories. I've heard the, the wonderful news of deliverance from this exact kind of thing from others? Would Jesus listen to me? Would Jesus be able to help me? Would he help me? Something the boy had, again, suffered with his entire life would have been just normal for the boy and for the dad and for the family. And at the end of the day, the dad takes his son back totally well, totally free. This is, a, this is a phenomenal encounter with Jesus where in a very short amount of time we see the kind of freedom that Jesus can bring. Not just the physical healing, although that's really important in this time, but also the, the underlying spiritual healing this boy desperately needed and the whole family desperately needed. <coughs> Jesus wonderfully, lovingly restores us under health, restores the relationship like the barrier of relationship between the father and the son that they would have had because of uh, the, bo- the, the way that this spiritual oppression was manifesting physically in the boy being un- unable to speak. <clears throat> it's, again, it's wonderful. Interestingly, the disciples then come to Jesus later. They go into a house. The disciples go, hey, Jesus, before the unclean spirits would listen to us, and they'd go and we rebuke them. How come this one didn't? What's different? What's the story? If you read earlier, they had been given authority over unclean spirits. They were sent out by Jesus and exercised that authority. And they come back saying, wow, this is amazing. You know, the one where Jesus says, well, don't celebrate that the demons are subject to you. Celebrate that your name's written in the book of life. <clears throat> don't celebrate that you got this power. Celebrate that you know the Father. In Matthew's gospel, he recounts Jesus responding to the disciples by telling them they couldn't drive out the unclean spirit because of their little faith, because of their unbelief. So in that moment, they didn't trust Jesus. They weren't standing in their delegated authority. Rather, they were trying to do the things, the process, the the material things, like the algorithm that they had used before. They were trusting their process, They weren't trusting in where their power came from. And so they were unable to do it because of their unbelief, Jesus says. Remember, Jesus just said to the dad, everything's possible to him who believes. That's to put into action right belief. Everything is possible for that guy. And these guys who had done it before couldn't do it this time. Jesus says, because you didn't believe. You weren't putting into practice what you know to be true. You were trying to do, like go through the motions of what you'd done before. You're trusting in your abilities, 
trusting in the process rather than trusting in the power from him. They were functioning in the natural against things in the supernatural, and Jesus says, that doesn't work. I fear because we are surrounded by the ordinary demonic, but don't see much of this extraordinary demonic, that we totally forget that we're at war in, in the spiritual sense. We totally neglect that side of things. And so we, what we do is we actually get into process, and process starts to work. Okay, if I do this, then this is the result, and therefore we just kind of build our lives algorithmically uh, and, and kind of build a house which totally excludes the, the, where our supernatural power comes from. And we learn, oh, we can do things this way. And even when, if initially they, they are birthed supernaturally or, or from the trust we have in Jesus and we step out and we do things in faith or in belief or in trust of Jesus and we see Jesus kind of radically, powerfully move, the next time we don't go back to the source of our trust and power, we go to what do we do? Let's do that again because that's what worked. And this is what the disciples do and it doesn't work. She says it doesn't work. You can't fight spiritual battles with material or worldly weapons. He says this kind only comes out by prayer. Well, Paul writes to the Ephesian church about this kind of spiritual battle. This is what he says. As part of this will be probably very familiar to you. Perhaps what comes before and after may be less familiar. This is what he says. He says, finally, so this is the end of his letter, to, as a great reminder to the Ephesian church. Finally, be strengthened by the Lord, by his vast strength. Where does our strength come from? Where does our power come from? It comes from the strength of the Lord. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. Interestingly, our kids right now having a party, having just learned about the armor of God and kind of, in a sense, you know, uh, uh, receiving one as a reward each week for, for learning about these things. Um, having a party today, haven't got the whole armor. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. Because the deceiver, the enemy, is at work in the very ordinary, mundane sense and in the extraordinary sense, we need to stand and be strengthened by the Lord's strength in the armor of God in order to stand against his schemes. He goes on, For our struggles are not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. <clears throat> that is a kind of unclean spirit that we're talking about in our passage today in Mark. It's a, another authority, one who has rebelled against Yahweh's ultimate authority. Because the cosmic powers of this darkness against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. We don't see these things. We see the outworking. We see their work. We don't see them, and so we can neglect them and forget about them. And Paul writes as a reminder, he says, we can't forget about it. We can't neglect this. We can't use natural means for a supernatural battle. We will misidentify the enemy. We will think that people are our enemy. We'll think that we are, like, you know, our brothers and sisters are enemies because we've been deceived. We've fallen for it because we haven't been aware of it. We have to be aware of the spiritual battle happening. He goes on, for this reason, because of these things, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day, having prepared everything to take your stand. Stand, therefore, with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, your feet sandaled, sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And then he finishes like this. Pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request. And stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. So God has given us truth, righteousness, readiness, faith or belief or trust, salvation and the Holy Spirit as 
armor and weapon in the spiritual fight. And we, we have to take up these things. We've got to live in them. Because again, our battle is not against flesh and blood. Our pe- people are not our enemies. They are captives of the enemy. So we don't want to incorrectly view them as our enemy. We are the captives of the enemy. The very ones that Jesus has us on mission to liberate. We've got to be aware that the war is happening in the spiritual realm. We can't neglect it because we don't see it. We can't use a natural solution to a supernatural problem. Now, what I'm not trying to say is that you know, there's a demon lurking behind every problem. That's not, that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm saying we should put everything down to a spiritual attack. Or when things that don't go your way, well, I'm, you know, I'm just under attack today. Uh, it's, not, it's probably not uh, what's happening. So I'm not trying to say that everything is going to be because of a spiritual attack. Sometimes our problems are because of our sin. Sometimes our problem is because of somebody else's sin. Sometimes our problem is because of just unwise decisions that we've made. Not sin necessarily, just ignorance or neglect. Sometimes our troubles are because God is doing a work in us and growing us. So I'm not trying to say every every bad thing that happens to you, well, I'm under spiritual attack. That's not what I'm saying at all. But some of them are. We don't want to fall into the error of, um, like uh, I heard someone say, uh, when in doubt, cast it out. Uh, we, don't want to, we don't want to do that. Uh, what we want to do is we want to use our discernment. The very thing that the disciples failed to do in our text in Mark. They didn't exercise their discernment. They were like, oh, here's a problem. I know how to deal with this problem. I've done it before. I'm just going to go ahead and do it. Using natural weapons in a supernatural battle. No, how do we do that? How do we exercise our discernment? Paul tells us. I mean, Jesus tells us. Paul explains how. He says, uh, again, pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request. So pray for yourself and also pray for all the saints, he says. So pray for your brothers and sisters who are also in the battle. We have to, you have to pray for yourself. Again, we're not rushing into a spiritual battle without the armor, without the sword, unprepared, undiscerning. That's foolishness. It's arrogance. It's presumptuous even. Uh, Paul says exactly the, do the inverse. Be prepared. Have on the full armor of God. Be armed. Be discerning. Pray first for yourself and also for your brothers and sisters in battle. The disciples were confronted with a spiritual problem but hadn't discerned what they were dealing with. Why prayer? Why is prayer featuring so heavily? Uh, why does Jesus say you can only deal with this because of, through prayer? And then Paul writes, how do, you, how do you actually engage in the spiritual battle? It's prayer. Because prayer is putting your trust in Jesus into action. Prayer is putting your belief into action. It's activating your belief. Is actually what prayer is. Prayer is not just verbalizing your wishes into the air. It's not just hoping in, in a kind of sense that the world uses the word hope. Prayer is putting into practice the lordship of Christ. So prayer is saying, <clears throat> I don't have the answer. You have the answer. Prayer is saying, I don't know. You know. Prayer might even be saying, I think I know, but I want to act according to your wisdom, not my best ideas. That's what prayer does. Prayer is putting ourselves in our place. I don't mean that in like a, in a, in a insulting kind of way. I mean that in a glorious kind of way. Prayer is taking ourselves off of the throne of our lives and acknowledging Jesus as the Lord of our lives. Prayer does, not, it's not limited to these things, but it does all of these things. Prayer is in a sense impractical in that it's not 
It's not uh, putting my natural effort into the problem first. But in another sense, prayer is incredibly practical because when our problem is spiritual, the solution is spiritual and God is, has authority over every spirit. And so while it, f- it might feel like, well, I'm wasting my time now until I go out and just do it, or prayer is just like, it's the, it's the G up, it's the charge up, and then I actually go and, then I go and solve my problems. I've got to reorient our understanding about prayer. And no, prayer is, is the, the key to the battle. It's the first step. It's the continuing step. It's the follow through. It's the, it's the praying always. Prayer is spending time with God, knowing Him deeper, submitting to Him more fully. It helps us to learn His voice. It helps us to understand Him become more like him. And in today's encounter, when the dad and the son met Jesus, the dad prays. That's all the dad's doing. He is praying. He goes to King Jesus, the higher authority. And he says, I have a problem. So he goes to the one who has authority over his problem. And Jesus responds to his prayer, his his faithful prayer, his trust-filled prayer by exercising his authority and freeing his son. So when you start to think about what, what is prayer, I mean, this is an example of prayer. It's going to King Jesus and submitting to him and acknowledging him as the Lord with authority over our problems and saying, here is my problem. Please help Please help me in my problem. That's prayer. That's what the dad does. That's what we do. We who put our faith in Jesus, we put our trust in him, we believe in him. That's what what it means to believe in him. It means just like you trust that the chair will hold your weight, we trust that Jesus has the power and the ability and the desire to do the things that he says he's going to do. And he proves faithful time and time and time again. And so we give him our trust. We give him our allegiance. We go to him with our problems and he loves to hear from us in prayer. Prayer is not just some magical, mystical conversation. There are no uh, secret combination of words that you can unlock some magic power. It's not what prayer is. Prayer is just like what this dad does. It's just going to King Jesus because he's the king, because he has the authority and saying, please, would you act in your authority and help? That's what prayer is. We can do this every day we go to the king. Every day we go to him and say, here, here is my problem. I trust you. What does it look like for you to put your trust in Jesus uh, with your present circumstance? Man, we need to be praying so that we can, again, gain the mind of Christ, but also ask him for wisdom to discern what is this problem that I'm dealing with? Is this just a physical problem? Is this just a mental problem? Is this a psychological problem? Is this a combination of those problems? Is this a spiritual problem or a combination of all of those problems? Is this a spiritual problem that's manifesting as a physical problem? Is this a relational problem? Or... Have we succumbed to the enemy quietly at work in the ordinary demonic? We need discernment. So we must pray. We must ask. Our enemy is in flesh and blood, so we can't reason or work or strategize or wish our way to victory over it. Uh, We can only go to the one who has authority over everything, the one who says to the one who believes everything is possible. Man, that's... That's the promise and the hope that we stand in. Not the end of our problem, but that Jesus has the authority and we are, we are in him. That's the, it's the most wonderful thing. This is such a phenomenal encounter with Jesus, both from the perspective of the Father, certainly the Son, but then also from the disciples, who, who we should probably be most relating with in, in, this, uh, in this story where we grumble because we forget we're walking with the king. 
and we fail and falter because we forget that we're walking with the King. We try to do things in our own strength, in our own power, forgetting that He is right there with us and has gifted us, imputed to us even. Sonship, uh, daughterhood, His Holy Spirit to empower us to do those things that He is calling us to, to win every, every battle. And winning every battle doesn't look like, all my, again, every light turns green, all my circumstances become easy, but it looks like walking with our King Jesus forever. And that's a wonderful, wonderful promise. Okay, in our discipleship groups this week, we're going to put into practice our discernment. I'm going to pray for ourselves and for each other. Uh, what, we, what I'm really keen for us to do, this week especially, but also going forward, is to try to, again, uh, open up our eyes to not just see the things in the natural like we are predisposed to do, but to see things also in, in that spiritual sense so that we don't keep trying to fight spiritual battles with physical and material means. We go to King Jesus, who's authority over all of them. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for uh, these words. Thank you for your scriptures. Thank you for your goodness and your kindness to us in Jesus. Thank you that even when uh, in this story Jesus gets frustrated with his people, he still delivers the boy and his father, still proves faithful. And Father, for each of us in our circumstances, with our problems, for whatever the cause of those problems, Lord, we look to you. We seek you first and above everything else because uh, you are the one who can help. We trust in you. We put all of our hope in you. All of our eggs are in the one basket, Lord. We trust you. And so uh, we don't say if you're able to help, we know we've seen it over and over and over again as you've responded to Uh, putting belief in action, our faith, our requests, our prayers as we come to you and acknowledge you as King and and, uh, put before you those things that are happening in our lives. We've seen you time and time again deliver us from these things. So we ask again, Lord, we, we say you are able, we know it. So we ask, please act. Help us to discern when we're fighting the spiritual battle, help us to fight with the spiritual tools you've given us. Truth, righteousness, faith, salvation. Father God, that we uh, fight with your sword, the Word of God. That we know that uh, ultimately you're the victor. You're the one who's, who's won every battle you've ever fought. And so uh, we want to thank you that you have um, brought us into union with you, the victor. Made us victorious with you. So that we are more than conquerors. Even in our trials and in our suffering and in our struggles and in persecution, we are already more than conquerors because we're in you. us uh, with our own battles, but also when we're praying for our brothers and our sisters, Lord, it must be there for them as well. And Lord, show your glory. Do your work. Exercise your authority. Be glorified in all the earth. Uh, hasten the day when Jesus returns and bring, makes all things new. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.